So thanks, Dominic. Um, for those who I haven't met yet, my name is Lachlan Fleetwood. I'm currently wrapping up my PhD at the University of Cambridge. Uh, I want to take my 10 minutes today then to introduce some of the sort of broader, maybe slightly bombastic claims from my uh, recently completed dissertation. Uh, so some of this will be familiar to those who I spoke to at the poster last night. But in brief, my project looks at science and empire in the Himalaya. And in particular, I focus on the first half of the 19th century, uh, a time when the mountains are first being measured and realized uh, that they're actually much higher than the Andes, um, much to the outrage of some commentators in Europe. At the same time, the mountains are becoming the insecure northern frontier of an increasingly expansionist East Indian Company empire in South Asia. So from those two contexts then, I follow two overlapping sets of arguments through the mountains. The first is a close study on scientific practice within the particular high spaces of the mountains themselves, which is an approach um, which serves to reveal the extent to which uh, naturalists and surveyors depended on uh, pre-existing networks of labor and expertise. Uh, so this is just one example. Um, and I just put it up here as a reminder the extent to which this expedition is hugely dependent on labor and on routes that have existed through the mountains uh, for millennia. So methodologically then, I especially focus on the moments when things break down. So when scientific instruments fail, when the human body is deranged, uh, or when practices don't work. Um, and in then, in doing so, these sort of moments of failure, a fairly obvious point, are revealing then of the social relationships that underpin the knowledge being produced. In turn, I then use these moments to show the many ways that the mountains in this period are rendered as peripheral places, or the ways that they're read as aberrations from lowland and temperate norms, or read as aberrations from other mountains, uh, specifically the Alps and the Andes. And then think about some of the consequences for this. So both uh, for the way that uh, Himalayan people experienced empire, but also for the way that the mountains, or the relationship of the mountains to post-colonial South Asian states. So that's the sort of first and main focus of the project. My second argument then, which sort of sits above and behind this close focus on everyday uh, scientific practice or an expedition sociability, is on the role of global comparison in the rise of verticality as a framework for understanding both human and non-human worlds. So there's increasing recognition in this period that all sorts of scientific phenomena need to be mapped on a globe that's not only round, but that is also vertical. So natural historical specimens, geological samples say, plant specimens need to be uh, attached to a precisely quantified measured elevation above sea level if they are going to be able to uh, increase our understanding of, of natural history. Uh, and so what I want to focus on in the next few minutes then is the tension between these two arguments, which is the way that making mountains globally commensurable and comparable requires erasing the role of Himalayan people and also er erasing the numerous sort of failures of practice. And in particular, I want to do this by looking at uh, a, a number of European uh, atlases and the way that uh, publishers acquire material uh, from the networks that I trace in my project to create in this period uh, new types of images of mountains. Uh, this is one example um, here. This is from Heinrich Berghaus's Physikalische Atlas from 1838. Uh, and it's, this is the Himalaya section of a larger slide. And we'll see here that uh, Dalagiri is depicted as the highest mountain in the world. And it arranges all sorts of natural historical information in three dimensions. So in doing so, it turns the Himalaya into a high mountain type, one which can then be compared globally, which we see in the full image. So as well as the Himalaya, we also have uh, the Andes, the Alps, uh, Tenerife and Lapland, all of which are sort of exemplar uh, ranges in terms of building up a picture of global verticality. Um, but it's sort of, all the information here is presented as sort of equally uh, reliable and advanced, but that's actually not the case. And just one quick example, in the Alps we see glaciers, in the Himalaya there are no glaciers yet, even though um, the sort of the existence nature of glaciers in the Himalaya are debated. So there's this sort of unevenness with which this picture is built up, um, presents it uh, all as the same though. In this project then I'm working, uh, building on work on mountains, on biogeography by scholars like Marie Noel Bourget, um, Janet Brown, more recent work on verticality by people like uh, John Matthew, Michael Reedy and Bernard de Barbio. Um, this scholarship uh, has understandably, overwhelmingly uh, focused on 
Alexander von Humboldt, uh, and in particular on his famous image of Chimborazo, which uh, John kindly showed us yesterday. Um, and of course, actually, Berghaus's atlas was initially uh, designed as a visual counterpoint to Humboldt's later work, Cosmos. Uh, in terms of continuities as well, actually, I think Bussignol is depicted on the side of the Andes, his ascent in 1831. In my project, though, I actually am interested in the way that the naturalists in the Himalaya were reading and positioning themselves in relation to Humboldt. And particularly the moments when Humboldt's high authority and the sort of precedence of the Andes as a mountain type would lead to initial sort of confusions or contradictions. So the times when the comparisons um, could actually add to scientific uncertainties around things like glaciers, but also around uh, altitude uh, physiology or the line of perpetual snow. So these comparative tableau then present an ordered and an orderly world, but they belie the way that understandings of the vertical globe are very much in flux. Uh, and this is not least because of the ongoing efforts to fit the Himalaya into the picture, which, spoiler for those who saw the poster last uh, night, is graphically illustrated in an updated version. So this is the 1851 version of Berghaus's atlas, and we now see uh, Kanchenjunga, which by this time has been measured uh, and confirmed as higher than Daliguri, is sort of awkwardly tacked onto the side of the original image. Um, little does the, unfortu uh, the uh, unfortunate artists know that in less than five years they will have to redraw it again and space will finally be made for Sagamatha, Chung Malungma, or as we know it, Mount Everest. So it's only in the 1810s that Chimborazo uh, and the Andes have been displaced as the world's highest mountain, uh, much to sort of Humboldt's ongoing chagrin. And this, ta this sort of tableau indicates just how rapidly uh, the vertical globe is still evolving. Kanchenjunga is not the only addition though, and we also see now the sort of famous celebrated and measured Pindari Glacier has been uh, added as well. So some of those earlier debates and, and uh, confusion around glaciers has been uh, cleared up. What is actually more interesting to me though than what is added is what is taken away. And the way that imposing global commensurability brings about multiple erasures, uh, both intentional and unintentional. So as I said, the bulk of my project focuses especially on the explaining the many ways that practicing science in the mountains was laborious uh, and prone to breakdowns. But these atlases necessarily erase those disconnections uh, and failures in preference for an aesthetic sense of completeness. And most insidiously, these sorts of erasures are not equally applied. So as I uh, talked about at the beginning, the uh, scientific practice is overwhelmingly reliant on these pre-existing networks, especially of Botia, Tata and Lepcha, uh, all of which are necessarily uh, silenced here. Likewise, the way that naturalists draw on intergenerational oral uh, traditions to understand, say, the movement of glaciers over time, again, invisible. Uh, and, and similarly, just more broadly, the uh, cosmo ongoing sort of cosmological significance of the mountains, both within South Asian religion and also uh, indigenous topographies of the mountains are all here overwritten and subsumed within this uh, globally comparable language of scientific biogeography. So in tracing these erasures then, I ultimately want to argue that we need to consider dis disconnection, I'm you know, not the only one to say this, but we need to connect, consider disconnection as much as connection, and that this is understanding, uh, or is essential to understanding what in this case are both sciences of the globe, in a sense measuring the shape of the earth, but also global sciences in their practice. Put differently, maybe then, the constitution of global mountains is both an intensive exercise in material terms, but it's also an intensely uh, imperial form of globality that's predicated on erasure and silencing. So at the, at, the, at the most broad level, then, the project is examining an attempt by European empires to impose a global norm in science and geography, recognising particularly that this continues to shape our understanding of the world, in this case mountains, uh, in often pervasive ways. By maintaining that close focus though on scientific practice within the particular space of the mountains, I ultimately want to show how incomplete, contested, uneven, contingent these globalizing norms are. And so the, the aim then of the research is to demonstrate or to show that it's essential that we understand these sort of supposedly universal, now taken for granted, categories by understanding their origins in often explicit, uh, explicitly imperial interests.